so the uh th- this nonsense that's out there about peanut butter being a gender uh oh. do you go into how all of that nonsense came about uh well my book was written 30 years ago and it does talk uh to a great extent about the background and it predicts a lot of these very kinds of things this you know gender neutrality and fluidity and all that kind of thing so you see some of it popping up in this chapter I'm proud enough to say that there are many people who still read this book today and they call me and say, I can't believe what you predicted in that book. It's all come true. (laughs) In fact, I have to say it has come true, unfortunately. So I'm going to launch into a bit of a discussion of why teachers of all people would want to talk to students about sex. And I need to remind our listeners here that it wasn't that long ago, or if any parent had heard that a teacher was discussing sex with their child, they would have gone into the school on a rampage and caused a riot. You know, what the hell are you doing? That's my job. I'm the parent. But um, when you see societies where an underclass is developing, and that has pretty much been the case in every Western democracy, um, we get broken homes, we get non-marriage, we get, you know, so-called couple dissolution instead of divorce. And we get a lot of kids who, in fact, are not being formed properly by their own parents, uh, a lot of whom are absent, uh, like fathers in particular. And that's particularly true in North America of the black community. I think about 80 percent of black homes in America are fatherless. I may have to eat that number, but I'm pretty close. So let me just explain what I think happened here, like how sex ed became a topic uh, in the schools. And I'll begin, first of all, with a little saying from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, He said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of the government in the next. That was a prophetic statement, for sure, and I think very true. And here's another quote from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose romantic sentimentalism is kind of infused through all this teaching. Here's what he said. Well, he said lots of things. He was actually an amazing writer, very gifted and beautiful writer. And I think if he actually saw the extent to which his thinking got used by the radicals of the French Revolution, he would would have turned in his grave. At any rate, in the romantic mode, uh, he said, all that I feel to be right is right. Whatever I feel to be wrong is wrong. So here's a man locating rightness and wrongness in the moral division that matters to most people inside the self. See, That was like in the 1760s. So this got it started a long time ago. And there have been various waves, I call them neo-romantic waves of this kind of thinking throughout the West ever since. You know, it kind of comes and goes. You get romanticism, as it's called, by specialists who study it. Uh, I was one of them. <laughs> uh, vacillating with rationalism. You know, romanticism goes, which is to say the stress upon feeling and sentiment and all these kinds of emotions as a higher truth. And then a rationalist comes storming back in and say, that's just egotistical crap, you know. What you need is more rationalism, more mathematics, whatever. At any rate, I want to begin now by saying some, I just have to read this because I can't remember it all. Sometime in the late 1960s, the world changed. The parents of a North American society, thankful to have survived world World War II, their principles of freedom vindicated, reveled in the community spirit and shared values, large families and material success. That's true. There was huge enthusiasm after the war, but but their children born to that success and living under the heavy shadow of the bomb felt differently. Our parents screwed up the world, 
the thinking went. You know, kids are all idealists. If you're not an idealist when you're a kid, you're not a kid. <laughs> so they said our parents screwed up the world. So we're going to create our own world and our own values. And to give due credit, they had an argument. In the 1960s, there was a booming industry in backyard bomb shelters. One Chicago homeowner mounted a machine gun on his shelter to keep his neighbors at bay. School children practiced huddling under, under their desks against the nuclear holocaust. And thus did the period 1906 to 1974 quickly give away to what psychologist Edmund Hoffman has called, it's a great phrase, personal liberation ideology or PLI, personal liberation ideology. The chief gurus of this movement were Paul Goodman, Fritz Perls, Carl Rogers, and Abraham Maslow. <laughs> Abraham Maslow rings the bell with me because I went, when I went back to Stanford in 1972 to teach for a quarter, quarter uh, I rented his house. But along with all the people I just mentioned who got this going, I'm just giving you the advanced story here. They all recanted when they saw the damage that personal liberation ideology was doing. They all more or less recanted their original position, but it was too late to stop the damage. Viewed as, as an extension of what I call the individualism illusion in this book, it's described in chapter two, PLI basically extolled singlehood, attacked traditional family values, sang the virtues of personal satisfaction, and taught that all moral values are a matter of personal interpretation and usefulness. It was intimately linked to anti-family anti population control. You know, these were the days when people like uh, Ehrlich was his name, can't remember his first name. He wrote a book called The Population Bomb. He was a Stanford prof. When I was there, I was an athlete, so I, I would be out at the track training in the afternoon sometimes, and Ehrlich would come out and do his little jogging around. But at the time, his book became an explosive bestseller. Oh, my God, you know, the population bomb is going to be crazy. The world's going to be overrun with people. And so what we needed was birth control instead of self-control. And abortion as control not really of reproduction, but of the consequences of our pleasure. There were books that came out like The Ways of Growth, The Baby Trap, the new sexual revolution, and open marriage. They all specifically attacked marriage as bourgeois and rejected traditional moral and social values. By the way, in Europe, the same sort of thing was happening. Simone de Beauvoir, for example, Jean-Paul Sartre's lover, uh, wrote a book called The Second Sex, which was part of the first wave of feminism. Um, that became very influential for some some of these same reasons. And by the way, at the end of the day, um, just before she died, she basically said, I got gypped. I got gypped, meaning she got gypped, gypped by Sartre, who was a well-known lover boy cruising around, having fun with all sorts of mistresses while she lived with him. And he knew it, she knew it, and so on. And she accepted it at the time. But at the end of her life, she came to her senses and basically said, I was gypped. Anyway, given the horrible legacy of World War II, collectivist morality and the failure of the established religions to attract the following, the urge to seek some form of higher individual inner truth was perhaps understandable. But in retrospect, the mortal error of this movement was that it rejected the wrong sort of authority. What it ought to have been rejecting was all the statist invasions of social and private life, thus encouraging the spontaneous reconstitution of community. Instead, in keeping with the Rousseau-based naturalism, which by then was being taught in all the schools, it rejected not only state-imposed forms of authority, and here's the key, but also 
all voluntary forms of familial, community, and religious authority. So instead of finding a higher inner truth, it found a lower one. And by the way, it's interesting to me that right now in the U.S., um, there's a movement away from, and this is a topic that really interests me. I'm sorry. I'm going to go off for a moment. Um, the American founding with the Declaration of Independence was pretty much a John Locke type of document, you know, life, liberty, happiness, and property above all, the right to property. Um, but it wasn't long before by the middle of the 19th century, well, that's a long time, had, had John Stuart Mill came along. And Mill gave this idea of libertarianism a tremendous push because, and this is the only thing people remember about his thesis, which was very well articulated. He invented what was called the harm principle. And the idea was that you should be free to do anything you want, no matter what, as long as you don't harm someone else. So that became kind of the um, cat of the Western world pretty quickly. And it would be difficult to overestimate the role that it plays in modern societies. I think I mentioned to your listeners once before, there's a well-known case in Canada, it was 2006 or seven, I think, called the LeBay case. And um, before this case came along, before it got to the federal court, the moral code in Canada was always assumed to be a community code. You know, it was about the whole community and what was good for the whole community, not just what was good for you. Uh, anyway, it was about a swingers club, which got started on top of a milk store or variety store in Montreal somewhere. And uh, the community started to protest because they realized that all kinds of men and women were going in there who were complete strangers to each other just so they could have sex. An expression I don't like, by the way, you know. Uh, at any rate, the community complained. It went to court. It got uh, it got defended by the court and then rejected by the superior court. Finally, it went to the federal court, and the federal court basically okayed the swingers club being in the community because it said, "Listen to this," and it quoted John Stuart Mill's little book called *On Liberty* to defend its judgment. It, I can't quote him right now, but it basically said that John Mills, John Stuart Mill's harm principle was the basis of modern individualism and morality. And with a stroke of the pen, that replaced the idea in Canadian courts. I mean, not everywhere. It takes time for these things to work their way through the system. <clears throat> but it became, a, in common law, what we call a precedent that uh, established the harm principle as uh, the most important aspect of morality. Now, uh, in America, the same thing happened. By the end of the 19th century, the uh, influence of John Stuart Mill w was just everywhere. And the idea of individual freedom was the idea that you can do, uh, like freedom's an absolute right, was the thinking. Whereas before that time, in our history, no one ever thought freedom was an absolute right. Freedom only meant something in the context of order. If you don't have order, freedom is chaos. It's just chaos. Uh, but that conveniently got dropped, and Mill's thinking began to dominate in what they call the Atlantic democracies, which is America and Canada, basically. Um, well, the long and short of it is there's right now, a reaction against this going on in the U.S. It's called common good conservatism. And the philosophy of common good conservatism, look it up, you'll be interested. There's some terrific essays being written by some American uh, scholars on this topic. Um, common good conservatism drew profoundly from the work of Edmund Burke, um, who said long ago that man Man has a need of control. A need of control must be placed somewhere, he said. And the less there is within, the more there must be without. 
that was a profound, um, profound uh, insight, uh, really, for the Western world. Well, that's, would, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask a question about, uh, uh, the, you mentioned the, the book of uh, On Liberty by Mill. Um, how, how do you make the connection between people who are seeking freedom from oppressive governments and stuff like that to the point where they are behaving immoral? Uh, it doesn't, I mean, I don't see the, the cause and effect here. There is only pos- po- potential uh, correlation, but uh, the, the people that I know uh, who are seeking freedom in the absolute... Uh, uh, Sorry, I, I'm just a little sick today. So I'm thinking slow in English. Uh, the absolute majority of the people are seeking freedom, but they are in, in, in almost all cases are very conservative in their approach to life and they are behaving very morally. Yes. Well, this is um, an enigma, isn't it? How do we answer that? Uh, I can't tell you how many people I know who are very left liberal in their politics, very conservative in their family. <laughs> And they don't see that. They don't see the the conflict at all. Because most people don't think philosophically or ideologically, um, you know. And they, the first bandwagon that comes along, they jump on it. Uh, the point I was trying to make is that in the North American democracies, the Atlantic democracies, the idea of freedom became, well, liberty was what they called it back then. Uh, slowly it became an absolute. It's not the case in Europe. For example, in Germany, uh, there's something called the Basic Law. Um, and the Basic Law basically states, I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing, basically states um, that human human liberty, uh, the German, all German citizens have the right to liberty uh, within the confines, get it? The confines of the Constitution and the moral code. Wow. That's not what Canada says. Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which I just wrote an article about for the Epoch Times. Uh, and if you'll excuse, excuse the vanity, I recommend you go look for it. it. It will tell you in a nutshell what happened when Pierre Trudeau, our pro- former prime minister, whose son is now prime minister, when he brought in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, excuse me, uh, note that there was no word of obligation or responsibilities in that title, and they are not mentioned in the Charter anywhere. But the German the German basic law specifies, as it speaks of liberty, it basically says, within the confines of the Constitution and the moral code, it doesn't say what the moral code is. It just assumes that the community has always had a moral code, a kind of common understanding of right and wrong, uh, which may alter over time this way and that way. But if you're a follower of the natural law, like me, and then you will know that from ancient times, you know, from Cicero's famous original expressions of the natural law right down uh, to today, it, it never changes. And as a famous scholar named Etienne de Gilson once wrote, he said, the natural law always buries its undertakers. <laughs> you know, people who try to get around it get, get buried by it. At any rate, as I say, they were trying, these, these uh, PLI folks were trying to, instead of finding a higher inner truth, I think they found a lower one. Um, but their initial thrust was to free themselves from moral con- outside moral control. That's very common. I have libertarian friends with whom I profoundly disagree, um, who basically say that morality is up to them. Um, you know, the metaphor I use is like a, a, a bubble. It used to be a bubble was over the whole nation, and everybody lived inside the bubble, and had shared values, shared more or less shared ideas about right and wrong, the common good, and all that. But after Mill, everybody got their own individual little bubble, and they walked around in this uh, conceptual bubble, you know, my world. It's all about me, right? If they bump into someone else's bubble, well, they would apologize or 
try to make it right, excuse themselves, or walk away, whatever. But there would be no common good, no community um, foundation for the moral direction of the whole society. So really what happened after Mill, and one of the great critics of Mill at the time, wrote a wonderful essay in which he said that if Mill's philosophy is taken to heart, he said, society ends up like a, a, a sled. Uh, I'm from Canada, so when we think of a sled in the winter, you know, being pulled by dogs, husky dogs, you know, but they're not tied to each other. They're all pulling the sled in different directions. And he said, then society is at an end. Wow. Uh, I think he's quite right. And we've been coping with that ever since. Um, and it's being reflected in what I'm reading to you here. It's come out in the classroom. Uh, Dr. William Colson, uh, who also later recanted, by the way, explained how he, Rogers and Maslow, quote, hatched a scheme, his words, in 1963 to bring the methods of value-free, non-directive um, psychology into U.S. classrooms. Uh, the process was designed to bring about this condition, was labeled MVE, MV for Victor E, which stood for Moral Values Education. And it became an international movement. It's perhaps past its peak now. I'm not quite sure how thoroughly it's in the schools, but it did its damage. Um, all MVE approaches take the stance that unless values are, get this, freely chosen by students, they are inauthentic. And of course, maybe that's an acceptable posture for mature adults who already understand the formative values of our culture, but surely not for unformed children. The idea was that parental directives, no-nos, social taboos and the like are remnants of a dictatorial or totalitarian moral code that amounts to indoctrination and that the starting point for all students, get this, must be a close and rational examination of the issues themselves, unfettered by the directives of others. So this is pure John Stuart Mill for babies. <laughs> That's what it is, right? He wants everybody walking around in their own little bubble, only worried about if they harm someone else. Otherwise, do whatever you want. In, an, in a 1982 American book on moral values education, uh, two, the two authors specifically urged public school teachers, this is, this is, I can hardly say it without getting angry, to set themselves in opposition to parents who want to, quote, impose, unquote, values or tell their children what they ought to believe. Now, if that isn't turning the apple barrel upside down, I don't know what is. And that got started in the schools. Uh, and I think most parents had no idea of what was going on because these people were exercising themselves to hide it from parents. In 1981, the World Congress on, quote, values in the school, unquote, attracted 42 nations and 900 delegates. And one of the most popular textbooks on moral values education was the one by Louis Rass and Sidney Simon that I just mentioned. It had by then sold over 500,000 copies. It is still used throughout North America, as are the writings and books of various uh, Canadian authors who talk about values clarification. Uh, for example, they'll say to a kid in the classroom, look, you're on the beach and uh, you're a parent, you're a father, if it's a boy, you're a father. Although today they may, they may say it to a girl who thinks he's a boy, I don't know. But you're on the beach and one of your kids is way over there drowning and somebody else's kid is way over there drowning. You can't save them both. Which one would you save? Well, most kids would say, well, I'd save my own kid. Teacher says, why? Why is your kid more valuable than that kid? And all this kind of stuff. 
totally shaking up, shaking up the children's sense of moral priorities of when they're within their families. Uh, so they call that values clarification, cognitive moral development, and the reflective approach. Get that? It's reflective, as if they really thought about it deeply, which they didn't. The logical objective of MVE is to systematically integrate its materials into all subjects of the curriculum at all levels of education, from kindergarten to the final year of secondary school. Uh, the technical term for saturating all school courses with a specific ideology, what, listen to this, while remaining undetected by their critics, okay, such as parents and church groups, very clearly spelled out in 1983 by the Northwest Regional Education Laboratory of Portland, Oregon. Oh boy, Portland, Oregon is a seedbed of all sorts of things. But they call it infusion. Teacher's job is to infuse moral values education into every subject in the school, mathematics, chemistry, uh, history, whatever. They've got to keep working at it, see, to convert the kids. Now, infusion is just a variation. We talked about this in another lecture of mine on the Fabian term permeate. So the idea was to permeate the schools. The Oregon report called infusion a key thread in what it calls re-education techniques. And it included an in infusion grid showing teachers how to perme permeate more than a dozen school subjects with a specific ideology. As early as 1974, as many as 2,400 courses in MVE were being offered in New York State schools alone. And I won't go on about that, but it basically spread everywhere. Uh, my next little section here is called Moral Values or Moral Imbeciles. <laughs> I remember when Senator Hayakawa from California he was a great professor of semantics and language studies. Um, he stood up in the U.S. Senate and said that an educational heresy has flourished, a heresy that rejects the idea of education as the acquisition of knowledge and skills. It regards the fundamental task in education as therapy. Uh, this got followed by, you know, another critic who warned that the simple truth is that the American, and I say Canadian, classroom has become a place where intense psych psychological warfare is being waged against all traditional values. Now, that's the truth. It's a war against the community, against all traditional values. And this is happening right under our noses. Now, I will say, and I was happy about this, when I was researching this book, I went to a couple of schools and spoke to the teachers, uh, sex ed teachers and all the rest of it, about this. And one of them turned to me and she said, Mr. Gardner, she said, you have to realize that it's true we are mandated to say these things and teach these things to the students, she said. <laughs> but I don't like much of it. And when I close that door, she said, it's my classroom. I tell, you, I tell them what I think is right. Well, I tell you, I, I almost gave her a medal. <laughs> anyway... As I said, much of the so-called values clarification depends on a staged valuation pro pro process leading the individual to a personal decision. And the teachers of this process are reminded constantly that they must commit themselves to the view, listen to this, that there is no right or wrong in any particular situation. They are to respect the student's moral values even if they disagree with him. You see, the reason he goes, stealing is not all, stealing is not always wrong. The hidden message is your parents, who say it is wrong, always wrong, are wrong. Therefore, the lesson proceeds, all morality is relative. And the point, argues another teacher of MVE, is that as total human beings, we should strive to be reasonably moral but not extremely moral. So this is what's going on out there. 
And I respond by saying, look, when we are lost in the forest, we do not proceed by throwing away our compass. <laughs> For most importantly, all great moral systems are transcendent. They aim to provide moral absolutes higher than the dictates of any state or those of any earthly bully or MVE teacher. Most of all, they are higher than one's self. They are higher precisely because they are not subject to revision by a, every teenager emerging from an NVE session armed with a teacher approved recipe for sociopathology. Contrary to the idea of reasoned reflection on values at every turn as a guide to authentic choices, great moral systems from whatever religion, and much in them is the same, function to provide their cultures with a basis for automatic moral response, not reflective moral response. Philosophers tucked away in their studies may reflect all they wish, but what society requires in the great mass of the people is a system sufficiently good, sufficiently high, and sufficiently automatic that ordinary behavior is affected by it without reflection, because all such automatic moral systems are other regarding, and they conceive a moral duty as something higher than the individual or the state. Um, so that's that was kind of my my judgment on that. This is why, contrary to all moral to MVE teaching, rather, all moral systems can provide spontaneous moral direction only to the degree that they inhibit continuous reflection. Any society must develop as good and as automatic a moral system as possible, shared voluntarily by as many of the people as possible, as deeply as possible. And that's what they're calling brainwashing and, and all that. But MBE teaches that we must be unburdened of the guilt that arises from not living up to the difficult external moral expectations of parents, society, or religion. Like what? Don't steal. Honor your mother and father. <laughs> you know, honor your vows. <laughs> They're calling these difficult, uh, difficult moral uh, directives from above. So, uh, But I say nonsense. I say social guilt is a prerequisite for the survival of any society simply because it is the outward form of, of conscience. And the function of any moral system is to make you feel automatically guilty if you transgress. But if whether or not you feel guilty is solely up to you, well, it's a recipe for personal evil, isn't it? Why are our students learning otherwise? And what are we going to do about it? I want to cite at the moment a, a discipline sheet from a little school in Toronto that warns parents, quote, make statements, not judgments. We should always avoid value-laden words such as good, bad, right, and wrong. Such words usually attack the child's self-esteem. So I say, the word good attacks self-esteem? Such confusion already. Self-esteem is a terrible term. All my life I said to my children, and now to my 16 grandchildren, it's not your job to esteem yourself. You earn the esteem of others by doing estimable things and acting and behaving as an estimable person. And then you'll find out whether you're esteemed or not. The idea that students should be good at self-esteem is like sick. It's morally and socially sick. Anyway, I want to give you just some other examples. There's something that goes on in the schools called death and suicide education. Students in such courses are asked to do bizarre things, such as cut out cardboard tombstones and write their own epitaphs on them, or take field trips to crematoria, or to write their wills. ABC television reported in 1988 that one girl had to watch a teacher pick 
human bones from crematoria ashes. She wept that she couldn't avoid picturing her recently deceased father. Others are asked to sit in coffins themselves, to view embalmings, to touch a still warm corpse, and so on. In a scathing article, the Atlantic Magazine wrote that such courses implicitly expect teachers to serve serve as psychologists with the children as guinea pigs, and that they reflect, quote, a view of education in which the molding of students' attitudes may be as important as, or even take precedence over, the development of their minds. In the 19, late 1970s, the National Education Association published something called Education for the 70s, which stated, Schools will become clinics whose purpose is to provide individualized psychosocial treatment for students and teachers must become psychosocial therapists. That's in writing. It's in print in this damn book, you know. So it's not like they were hiding it from us. Well, they were. They were hiding it. But fortunately, a lot of people, maybe like me, <laughs> found out about it. Um, one of the concerns about this type of death and suicide education, of course, is that the courses and the materials tend to stir up suicidal feelings in students because they present suicide as a possible rational solution to teen problems. Which is to say, in order to promote private morality, sex, and procreation as autonomous moral choices, Death, too, must be made natural and thus devalued so that it is severed from any religious, social, or moral meaning higher than the yes-no choice of the individual. I hope you haven't had too much of this already. Honestly, it, um, it makes me weep uh, to think about it because it's all still here and then some. It's gone mainstream cult-like worship of the self. Self is a term seized upon to replace the rejected concept of the soul. It's a kind of materialistic soul. The idea of the self is presented in course after course as a somewhat fugitive inner reality or a thing that evades our awareness of it until after much honest searching, there comes a revelation type melding of the various fragmented parts of one's being into a single identifiable unit. This melding occurs ideally as a sudden spiritual manifestation. But no one has explained how you really know when you found yourself or why you could not be fooled into believing it's the real you when it's not. Observe the inherent contradiction. How can I search for myself? In other words, how do I ever know which is the real self, the one seeking or the one sought after? It is a useless concept that has arisen from our vain effort to materialize our inner lives, and it speaks to a morally lazy culture that has turned narcissistic. Here we go. Students may ask to repeat mantras uh, such as my declaration of self-esteem. This, this was on the wall of my daughter's classroom, by the way. And the woman who invented it, Virginia Sater, she presents the self as a two-part thing divided into subject I and the object me. The last sheep students titillate themselves reading, quote, as long as I am friendly and loving to myself, I can courageously and hopefully look for ways to find out more about me, unquote. And Seder assures the reader that, quote, whatever I say and do, and whatever I think and feel at a given moment in time is authentically me, unquote. Now that's a recipe for self-delusion and false confidence if there ever was one. 
It's interesting. I think one of the observations I make on the way to the next little bit here is that the new egalitarianism in our midst, and it's here today with a vengeance, is an egalitarianism not of income, but of the mind. <laughs> in order to be good, in order to be approved by elites, we now must regiment our thinking. Uh, just a few manifestations of this. Remember, this was 1993. Our efforts to globalize student thinking, to impose a singular view of nature through so-called environmentalism, and to eliminate the competitive particularity of natural cultures through, quote, multicultural policy, unquote. So, and global ed environmentalism is the same thing. It promotes a funky new age notion of nature worship. Gaia, the earth goddess, replaces the transcendent god of religion. She is the goddess of the new church of nature, a kind of feminine planetary organism. <laughs> Through environmentalism, the schools are actively, if indirectly, promoting a new pantheism. It's the cute notion that all existing things have a theological status of their own, that things are right up there with conscious beings. My own daughter was taught about so-called global warming, quote unquote, but only as propaganda. She was never told, for example, that there is deep disagreement among the best scientists uh, as to whether or not it even exists. And that even if it does, it may be part of a 100,000 year natural cycle that the earth had much more carbon in the past, and according to many experts, is now carbon starved. Or that even if it's true, Canada might benefit economically from global warming. But there was no debate, and therefore no education. It was pure brainwashing. Multiculturalism is another global ed thrust. And this is the idea of getting rid of the nation state. Canada's own prime minister, Justin Trudeau, said proudly, that Canada, quote, is the world's first post-national state, unquote. What the hell did he mean by that? We're not quite sure, except I think he means that the bureaucratic state, uh, among whose figures he likes to move, would take over from the idea of the, of the nation state. And ethnicities would all be mixed together in a great big pot so that nations would no longer be uh, characterized by their ethnicities at all. Um, and that would get rid of the nation state. And we would end up with one world government and world state. So, Professor Richard Baer of Cornell University writes that values clarification indoctrinates children with what he called radical ethical relativism. He rightly maintains that if it's against the law to teach in the schools that God is the final arbiter of truth, it should also be against the law to teach that God is not the final arbiter of truth. Because there's no rational proof either way. This latter statement is also a religious one and the core of MVE teachings. So we've imported, imported a whole bunch of rationalist, atheistic, materialistic uh, teachers into our classrooms to brainwash our children. Bear said that, quote, it is intolerable in a society such as ours to have this notion imposed on a semi-captive audience of students in a public school setting as the sole truth about values. Bang on. Now, fortunately, fortunately, a lot of parents were protesting even at the time, and they have been ever since, but I don't think they've won much ground. Uh, here again is this, I think, quite shocking uh, uh, variation of the clash between the state and its schools. By the way, I don't think the government should ever be in education, period. We should not have public schools through a voucher system of the kind that was proposed by the great economist Milton Freedom, Milton Friedman. Um, it's not perfect, but we could give every 
parent a voucher for each child. So I had five children, I get five vouchers. They're worth whatever the average cost of education in the state is, say at that time, $6,000 for each voucher. But it's like a token, I can spend it at any school of my choice, give it to any school that I want my child to go to. I would not be restricted and directed by the government. Your child's going to this school down the road or that school over there. And if it's too far, we're going to public bus, bus him and buses, and all that kind of stuff, you know, ordering families around, educationally speaking. But um, a voucher system would automatically uh, switch the paymaster of the teacher from the state to the parents. And this is what I said we need. And I've said it before. I hope everyone who's listening <laughs> says it for the rest of their lives. Because we've got we've got to get our children out of the grip of government, and the only way I can think of to do that, other than purely private education, which tends to favor the rich over the poor, of course, is by distributing a voucher uh, for each child. The parent can spend it where they want. They can walk into the teacher and say, "You keep teaching that crap to my kid, and I'm pulling him out of this school, and I'm going to take my voucher to the school down the road." And the headmaster, teacher, the headmaster goes, or principal, whatever you call it, he goes, oh, don't do that. I'm so it see will basically operate as a business and they will have to compete for they will our have children. To compete. Yes, they'll have to compete for the approval of the parents, not for the approval of the Minister of Education, who dictates everything. OISE, it's called OISE in Ontario, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, is a very radical left-wing organization that my daughter had to go to to get her teaching certificate. But it's infested with radical leftist thinking, you know. And the idea of a voucher system, believe me, the teachers' unions, which are very powerful in almost every Western country, will fight this tooth and nail. But I say, if the parents would just learn about how it works and fight back, they would probably win. Look, there are kids. We're not giving them to you, you know. We're giving them to that school down there. And so, and by the way, my kids, grandkids, uh, have just been taken out of the school they were at for these very reasons and enrolled in a local Christian school. Suddenly, they're being taught about things that Socrates said and uh, Aristotle and Cicero and all the way up the chain, you know, stuff they would never hear of in public school. I was amazed and delighted. I think the voucher system um, that Milton Friedman applied it in Chile. I'm, I'm not sure in about Chile? it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because I, I believe it's still true. It was true when I wrote about it that uh, Holland, the Dutch, have had a voucher type of system for about 100 years. They have something like, uh, you know, 16,000 different school districts. I don't know. But you basically put your kid where you want, and it, it introduces a kind of competition between the schools for excellence in teaching, and essentially throws the um, um, the uh, leadership back back on the parents, takes it away from the teachers. There's William, an interest. I would in like I would like to remind you of the time we agreed that you are not going to go too long today. You're very kind and. I'm actually revved up and feeling good about this. So if you want me to continue for a while, I will. Yeah, if you feel good, of course. Yeah. Um, at the time, there was a very well-known um, criminal uh, a criminology professor named Stanton Samenow. He was one of the foremost, world's foremost authorities on the juvenile criminal mind. He wrote a book about it, which I read years ago, uh, because he was fascinated. He wondered why, you know, there'd be criminal mind in young people. And he said, and this fits right in with what MVE is trying to teach. He said, criminals believe that whatever they want to do at any given time is right for them. They regard the world as a chessboard over which they have total control. Despite his knowledge of what is legal and illegal, the criminal decides that he can make 
exceptions for himself, just because it suits him at a particular time. The fact that he wants to do it makes it right. Although the criminal may not accept what others consider moral standards, he claims to have his own set of morals. Just the fact that he has decided on a course of action legitimizes it. There in one paragraph, we have the uh, psychology kind of kind of summed up. Uh, <laughs> and perhaps I, I, I'll talk just a little bit more about, about all this and then leave it for today. Because uh, next time I want to talk about, and you'll be really shocked, I think, uh, to hear of, hear of some of the actual materials that are being used in the classroom for sex ed. Um, but just to recap, um, this is something the parents can change. And uh, the voucher system, as I mentioned, and various other types of schooling in the U.S. in particular, called charter schools, has been changing it to a very small degree. Charter schools are incredibly successful. They're a kind of low-end private school, especially uh, popular in um, low-income communities where previous to their existence, parents, this is especially black parents in places like Chicago, never went to a school meeting, never went to any of that stuff at the school. Uh, oh, who cares? Let them look after. But once it became a question of like spending their voucher at a charter school, suddenly they were interested. Suddenly they went to the meetings. Suddenly they wanted to speak to the teacher about little Johnny and why he doesn't understand mathematics and so on. And the teacher, of course, stood at attention and said, I better pay attention. I better pay attention to this. So there are ways to change all this. Am I optimistic that it's going to happen? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and that leads us to the, the great unresolved question of why the masses in democratic in the democratic communities of the world, I mean, I call them sheeple. <laughs> why are they so sheepish or sheeple? Um, and why are they allowing so many of these, these things to happen, which they know in their hearts and their souls uh, to be wrong? Um, well, I think one of the answers would be they get saturated with pleasures. Uh, years ago, Frank Stronach, he's the founder and president of Magna International. You may have heard of it. It's a huge auto parts company that he created himself. It's quite a fellow. Um, anyway, he told me that one of the uh, uh, motives for himself getting involved in politics, which he did, he failed at it, but he, he did get involved, was, was it so that everyone could be, become wealthier. And I think I shocked him and lost him as a friend when I said, maybe we're too wealthy already. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, um, there's a lot of people who have, you might say, have too much money. Uh, now, I am a freedom buff, so I don't think it's anybody else's business how much money you have or don't have. I'm speaking generally about the effect that a lot of wealth has on human communities. And I think one of the things that it does is it insulates us through the provision of a multitude of pleasures, which we get any time we go out or any weekend we go into, into town or go shopping. Um, um, the multitude of pleasures can insulate us from more important concerns that we should be paying attention to. Um, if you go to Fairview Mall, which is 10 miles from my house, it's one of the first and largest malls in Canada, um, created in the late 50s, I think. Still going strong, all modernized now. I mean, talk about distractions, okay? Get this. I got little grandsons. They're eight and nine years old. I'm walking them through the mall, and suddenly, right up there, floor to ceiling, there's like a 50-foot ceiling, I see this woman who's 
totally nude except for the skimpiest pair of thong panties you ever saw with her arms over her breast, kind of half hiding the bulge, you know, so you can see the breast, if not the nipple. They're still, you know, moral enough not to try to show that in public. But having said that, there's a whole naked lady right there with a gorgeous body and hardly dressed at all. And my grandson, they're looking up, up at this. And what am I supposed to explain to them why we do this? Grandpa, why aren't there giant pictures of men? You know, that kind of thing. Well, I was talking about distractions. And I think that um, people going to malls, spending the millions of dollars they do all the time. I mean, malls are great places to be sometimes. I'm just commenting on the impact that it has on our attention. We aren't paying attention. We just, when we hear about MVE in the schools, we stop paying attention. Let them look after that. It's not my problem. That kind of thing. Whereas I think in our original communities, and by the way, what's a community? Someone said to me years ago, I thought it was true. He said, if you don't know your neighbors, you don't have any neighbors. Now, there are lots of people living in my city uh, who have people living close by, but they don't know them. So you don't get this situation where two mothers, for example, are leaning over the fence, chatting with each other as they put the laundry on the clothesline, chatting with each other about what? About what's being taught in the schools, about the books that little Johnny's bringing home. You know, smaller communities, you can say, in a sense, less wealthy communities are more in touch with basic human values than larger, wealthier communities are. What's the first thing to do, uh, people do when they get enough money? to buy a bigger home and a bigger property. They get away from their neighbors, farther away. See? Now, that's a paradox, too, because uh, I used to have a farm, and there was no one within half a mile of me, but I knew them all. And that's because once you get that far out and away from the amenities of modern life, you often have to rely on each other. For example, I came home one day in my driveway, which had uh, was long, uh, 400 meters, 500 meters long. And the snow that I'd been plowing built up on the banks about four feet. It was getting so high that no matter how fast I went with the blade on the front of the Jeep, it wouldn't throw the snow over top. So I thought, what am I going to do now? So anyway, uh, we had an ice storm and the banks of snow got frozen. So you could drive through these two banks, four foot banks of snow to the house. One day I was at the office and I said to myself, boy, there's a hell of a storm out there. You know, the wind was really blowing all day and uh, blizzard, you know. And so I I drove home. When I got to the end of my driveway, I couldn't see it. There was no driveway. So what happened was the wind infilled the driveway right across for 500 meters. I had no driveway. So I went to my farmer neighbor and I said, You've got a huge snowblower. Would you mind helping me out? And uh, you should have seen this rig. It was enormous. He goes down. He chews that stuff and throws it out. And I had my driveway back. First thing, thing I did was get some nice cheeses and a nice bottle of wine and took it over to him to say thank you. You know, well, that's community. And that was even out in the country where we often have more community than we do in tightly packed cities. I don't think this idea that, for example, in uh, Stockholm, where 70, 80 percent of people live alone, I can't say whether they know each other or not. But I suspect these are lonely places. Anyway, out of closeness and out of community comes the social good. And I think the moral good is exactly what the people at the first part of this lecture were saying the children have to get away from, get away from the guidance. Get away from being told what's right and wrong and all that sort of thing. Well, it's completely backwards. And I, before I end, I should say that most of those profoundly influential uh, sociologists, psychologists, and all that, education specialists, did end up recanting after about 25 years 
they saw the damage it was doing. <laughs> For example, there's that famous case where some American students were in a math competition with some South Korean students. And uh, before the competition started, they asked the Americans and the South Koreans how good they were at math. And the American kids all ranked themselves like, you know, I'm super at math, I'm good at math, I'm great, <laughs> whatever, gave themselves a 10 or at least a nine. Uh, the Koreans who killed them in the competition had all given themselves mediocre rankings. You see, it's interesting how it goes. And even when I was in high school, you never saw in something like math or physics, you might where you can get correct answers or geometry, you might see a high grade once in a while. But in any other topic, we never saw a grade over 75 percent because the teachers wouldn't give. They didn't want to. It's called swelling your head. They didn't want to swell your head by giving you super grades. You know, have you walking around thinking you were some hot shot. There was no graduation ceremony at the end of any class. Even high school graduation in my school was just to uh, go say goodbye to the principal and uh, go home. You were expected to pass high school. It wasn't considered some kind of huge ceremonial event to swell your head again, you know. Well, I think maybe someday we'll get back to that, but we're certainly heading in the wrong direction now. You even have graduation ceremonies in grade one, grade one for the little kiddies, uh, you know. I'm not against parental appreciation. I love it. I love it. But um, I think we have to bring some balance back into how we teach our children. So next time we talk next week, uh, I will dig into some of the really unbelievable stuff that's being uh put in their minds. So thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, William. Um, just uh, would you like to take one question or it's enough for sure. today? Sure. Okay, one moment. Funky, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, William. Come thank on. you very much. Um, it's so unbelievably, unbelievably pertinent what you've been saying. I've been at my children's school this evening with my 15 year old and I was subject to a class in meditation and a variety of uh, kind of interesting um, ways to deal with stress. But what I observed was that the very discussion of it almost creates the opportunity for stress to evolve in the child's mind. So it's the way that they present information and explanations about what's going on in the child's brain in psychology, you know, they're literally um, presenting a psychology lecture almost, you know, some sort of strange, deranged version of it to get people to focus, as you said, on this very uh, materialistic, self-centered moral uh, sensibility. And, and uh, yeah, it, it was very pertinent what you said. And I, I very much enjoying um, hearing your research and, and your knowledge on this. It's fantastic. Keep going. It's, I'd love to carry this torch for you in some way and shadow some of your information and research because it's, a, it's been, a, I, I have seven children. It's a hot topic for me and has been for 15 years. Um, and yeah, God bless. And, um, you know, uh, uh, wow, the battles of home education and just what I've experienced and my own personal journey is something that is uh, very relevant to the topic you've picked for tonight. So thank you for taking the time because it's absolutely awesome. Keep it up. Well, we, thank are you you. <laughs> we are hearing you. Thank you for your comment. Um, and if you don't mind the flagrant self-promotion, I would encourage you to find, find a copy of the book. Yeah, I will do my best to um, watch the whole of this interview. I missed the beginning, but uh, I will swat like crazy to um find out more about you, where yeah, you, you, just, you just you just go I to got a it web... on ebay sorry i got it on ebay uh, seven mm -hmm. or eight years ago but it was a little hard to find it if you go to a books you know abe abe yeah. books they often have um used copies some of which are in pretty good shape 
And um, you can click it at my own website, any of my books there. Great. Uh, it's I'll been a journey, a journey, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's just, uh, it speaks to so many aspects of what's going on in society and this gradual, progressive, Tavistockian change, you know, this uh, towards uh, complete inversion, really, just moral inversion. And yes. yeah, I, I, I've been aware and sensitive to its effects for uh, probably now, a couple of decades. And, and, and don't forget, we let it happen. Yeah, that's the it thing. Would not, it, would, it wouldn't happen that's, by itself. And that's we what let it happen. I'm still letting it happen. <laughs> you know, so it it's is. a real battle for me. Yes, now I, I just, I'm sorry to go on about myself, but I write for the Epoch Times now because I like their motto, truth and tradition. So they published substantial articles of mine. The most recent one uh, was called From Soft Socialism to Soft Totalitarianism. It's basically asking the question, are we there yet, really? So I encourage you to go to Epoch. You can go to Epoch Times online and you can download the article. Um, but after I wrote it, I thought I want to write another one, which I will in a couple of weeks trying to show the transition from soft totalitarianism to hard totalitarianism. And it has led, this whole thing has led me to the conclusion that not only is there top-down totalitarianism like communist, communism, which was not only top-down but international, and fascism, which is just as top-down but nationalist, you know, there's also something I would call populist totalitarianism, where the people themselves are thinking in totalitarian terms and telling them, speaking to their neighbors and so on in the same way. Um, and that's why I say, we let it happen. There's something I'm going to call, I think, when I get to the article, bottom-up totalitarianism, where the people ripen themselves for total type systems. For, let me give you one example. Uh, when I was a young man, we had a wonderful doctor named Dr. Smith. If somebody got sick, we would call his office. He would come to the house, you know. And if we couldn't afford to pay him with money, we'd give him a chicken or something, you know what I mean? Like a gift, but usually it was money. And uh, he'd go back to his office or to the next client's home. As soon that dried up and the socialists, thinkers who were beginning to take over Canada in a top-down way, uh, invented uh, a kind of socialized medical system, which was tailor-made for Canada because it didn't actually, it doesn't actually own the medical system. Uh, it, it's all privately run, but it controls it from the top. For example, the government has money. If it wants more, it just taxes you more. So the government, what the government said to Canadians was uh, everyone should have the same access to medical care, the same whatever, the same whatever. And uh, we're going to make that happen. We're going to get rid of private medical care. So they started by outlawing private medical care. Not all of it. For example, you can still get a massage or, you know, homeopathy or whatever and pay privately. But if you want something from the list, the uh, list of government medical services, which is quite extensive, uh, you don't pay a penny. It's all taken from your taxes uh, at the end of the year. Uh, and the doctor is not allowed to charge you any more than what the list says. Well, the way, the way that um, the government in Canada got away with doing this is because we have 10 different prov provinces in our federation. Who's, one of whose duties is medical care. It's not a federal duty. The government just said, okay, we can't touch it because it's not a federal duty, but we can force you to abide by the terms of, you know, access to all, portability from one province to the other, of the right to free medical care. First of all, of course, it's not free, it's prepaid. <laughs> and no one I always tell my kids, when I hear them saying that something is free, I say, it's not free. <laughs> Someone has paid for it. Could you just say prepaid and get it right? 
It's just like when they say, use the word capitalism. I said, stop. You have to start rejecting some of these terms. What is fantastic about our system is not capitalism. Everybody uses capital, especially governments. What's fantastic about it is free enterprise, that we can freely enter into enterprises, private enterprises, and form them ourselves and, you know, make it or break it. <laughs> so anyway, what the government said about medical care was, we, you know, we have a Jesus complex, I guess they were thinking. We can make the citizens so beholden to our party. This was especially the Liberal Party of Canada, which has been in power almost always has since uh, forever. And so the government said, we can make the citizens so grateful to us and so beholden to us, we'll give them free medical care. That's how they advertise it. But how are we going to do that? Since that's a provincial prerogative and we're not allowed to interfere in the constitutional rights of the provinces. So what they said was, here are the five terms. I mentioned some of them already. I forget the others. Portability to everybody, access, and so on. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to tax the hell out of all the citizens. And we're going to tell the provinces, if you come on board and agree to all these five terms of socialized medicine, we will pay half of your costs. Oh, boy. So the provinces went half of our medical costs? Wow. So most of them signed on right away. A few of them, the more conservative type provinces, objected and refused. They said, no, no, we're not going to go with that. We're going to remain a free province, um, a free country. And, but they eventually caved. Everybody caves. There are billions of dollars on the table. So that's how Canada ended up with something they call socialized medicine. But it's not really socialized. It's kind of nationalized medicine, not socialized. It's not owned by the government, and the government doesn't provide the service, um, and so on. It's all privately rendered. But if my doctor, I've seen a lot of doctors lately, uh, he's had 40 years of experience. He's incredibly skilled. If he decides to charge, say, the system, more than the $15 that it allows him for whatever it was he did for me yesterday, he can be fined or even go to jail. And so I, of course, I say, why should a doctor be with 45 years experience not be able to charge whatever he wants? We're going to him for the experience. We don't want some kid just out of university who hardly knows, you know, which way is up. He gets the same $15 or whatever the amount is. See, there's lots of unfairness in the system. Uh, and uh, when it began in Ontario, I think I mentioned this before, but the people don't see it. They're not going to do anything about it. When it began in Ontario 45 years ago, the medical, the government's medical budget, Ontario government medical budget, ate up about 25% of all government spending in the province of Ontario, which is where I live, a province of 13 million now. But slowly, 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 it's been going up over that 45 years. It's now just that far from 50%. In other words, so-called free medical care, which is not free, it's prepaid. They tax the dickens out of us to give it back to us. Yeah, is crowding out other government services which we also pay for. Now, this has to end at some point. But you know what's disappointing to me? It's not going to end through a frank and rational confrontation with the inherent stupidity in the system in the, in the first place. It's not going to end by some prime minister or whatever standing up and saying, it's not working, it can't work, because when you promise all the citizens filet mignon instead of a hamburger, there's going to be trouble. There's got to be trouble. And the trouble is here now at 50%. But you know what? No one's talking about it. <laughs> Except once in a while, you see a little editorial where someone has figured it out and warned us. But the government just sweeps it. You know, some bank has said, we've analyzed the situation. We're cruising for hell here. Uh, you better do something. The government doesn't do anything. It just keeps going. It can't go on forever. And so just the way that socialism broke down in, in um, East Germany, 
and in the Soviet Union, which, by the way, I'm, I'm going to say I, I predicted in my book, The Trouble with Canada, these are systems that fall by, the, by their own weight. Um, and uh, one of the main reasons is they're not getting price signals. Um, now, I've been to the doctor a lot in the last month, month or so because i got a few health issues going on. I haven't taken a penny out of my wallet for any of it. You know, other people are paying for me and I'm paying too. I've, I put a hell of a lot of money into the system, uh, not voluntarily. Um, so why did I raise that? Just that I don't know what any of that actually costs. There are no price signals to patients in the Canadian system. Now, if you call Mayo Clinic and you say, I want a heart valve replacement, which I think is what they're going to do with me. Please, what's the budget? Within a day or two, private medical care, they'll send me back the cost of, of getting a mechanical valve put in my, my heart. You know, it's going to be about 100000 if I go there, 60000 for the procedure, 40000 for the, the building and the room and the food and the nurses and the services. But it's all up front. Now, I would venture that that costs just about the same in Canada, maybe a little less, Canadian dollars worth less, but pretty close. But you know what? We never see a bill except when tax time comes around, when we have to swallow it all. So, as I say, uh, it's worked well in a sense. Uh, I've got some great medical care. Uh, and for $280 billion a year, I should have. Uh, but it can't keep going. It's going to break down. And Canada is going to get egg on its face for having started it in the first place. Okay. End of story. I, I just wanted to mention about the price uh, signal mechanism that uh, Ludwig von Mises was, I think, the first one to, to write about it from yeah. the Mises Institution. Yes, so he was. Uh, and it's all very fascinating. And in the trouble with Canada behind me there, <laughs> I've got half of a chapter on what happens to an economy when you lose uh, price signals. Uh, yes. It simply becomes, like, like I said, I had a shoulder replaced. I have a titanium joint here. I got my shoulder got oh, just destroyed in a judo accident which I was studying at the time. And uh, it, I've got a titanium joint in my body. I have no idea what it cost. I, I haven't got a clue. And if they do the valve for my heart, I'm not going to have a clue what that cost either. If I want to find out, I got to Google for the cost of a valve in the USA. And then I can kind of figure it out. But as I say, I will never get a bill for that. But the country is getting the bill. Yes. Um, okay. William, thank you very much for coming as usual. It's, it's been a pleasure. It's always super interesting. Uh, would you al allow me to send uh, to the group the, the link to the article that you uh, wrote in the Epoch Time about from soft so socialism to soft totalitarianism? Yes, Can I send please it? do. I would, be, I would be honored. Thank you very much. Okay, I will send it immediately. Uh, I would like to remind you that every time after we are done, I'm sending you in private uh, the video of the yes. presentation. So and I've been you post posting check. them. I've been posting them on my YouTube channel. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So you'll see them there. Yeah, and the most important yeah. thing: please take care of your health, and please know that all of us are praying and wishing for your good health and quick recovery. And uh, please do take care of, of yourself. Yes. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week. Definitely. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great stuff.